Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, can uh, everybody hear me well? Oh. Oh. Uh, now, can anybody hear me well? <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, in this presentation, uh, I will attempt to show you how safe and clean code can significantly reduce the risk of failures in our applications. Uh, if you wish, you can follow slides for this presentation on your own device. They are available under this link uh, on my GitHub. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see this well. Levapec.github.io and uh, very long title, this one uh, in camel case. Uh, this talk uh, is not supposed to be an introduction to programming in Scala or introduction to advanced functional programming principles. Instead, uh, I want to introduce you some real-life examples, some code snippets, uh, and show that improvements that may seem trivial uh, can enhance code quality. Uh, some of them will be strongly connected to Scala. Uh, however, some might be seen as generic ones uh, that could be applied to any programming language. Uh, I will discuss compile time versus uh, runtime errors, uh, mainly, mainly using examples that I encountered since I started using Scala, and demonstrate some tips and tricks that I find helpful. Uh, now a few words about me. I'm using Scala since the end of 2015 when I left Java and Scala became my uh, first programming language. Uh, I currently support creation of cloud native applications and migration existing systems into cloud in Comar. So let's get started. Oops, it didn't work. So, okay. Uh, I will start with short, int short introduction and I will show you a path from scratch to the application running in production. I will also point which element of that path this presentation uh, describes. Uh, then I will talk a little about error categories. Uh, next, I will discuss application configuration. I will outline what it is and what traps it brings for us. Uh, I will review default config values and lazy values. After that, uh, I will discuss uh, type safety problem with examples connected with protobuf serialization, ACA actors, and JSON serialization. Then I will tell a few words about implicits. Uh, at the end, I will introduce examples connected with types that are different according to business, however, are often encoded as the same types uh, on the code level and thus are error prone. I will discuss possible solutions, uh, including type aliases, value classes, and tag types. After that, I will quickly sum up the presentation. Uh, now I will quickly show elements that forms the final product. I will not mention every possible element or step. The goal of this is to put this presentation in the right place. So project typically starts from idea which responds to some business needs. Then the idea needs to be mapped to system architecture, system components. Uh, here, uh, Things like uh, domain-driven design might be helpful to get rid of the border between uh, business and implementation, of course, if project size is enough to apply DDD. Uh, when you have overall high-level design ready, you start thinking of more detailed architecture, how components should talk to each other, should communication between them be synchronous or asynchronous, uh, do they need message broker between Uh, 
Next, uh, you have to consider individual uh, component itself. Oh, didn't work one more time. Mm. You now know uh, component responsibilities. You know how uh, it should behave. You need implementation and tests now. And here comes Scala, finally. And I'm going to focus on this part of software creation process. Of course, creating a final system uh, doesn't end here. Uh, some steps are repeated in loop until success. There are also some additional, like deployments. But it is Scala Meetup, and uh, we will focus mainly on Scala code. Uh, in each step, in each element, I've already mentioned uh, something can go wrong. We're just people. Uh, we will investigate some code snippets and see if they contain some traps. Okay. Uh, but uh, before that, uh, let's say a few words about failures. We do not like it. It is not desired behavior for application to finish with an error to throw exceptions. Uh, some failures can be avoided. However, some are very difficult to get rid of. Uh, there are possibly many ways to split errors into categories. Uh, the most common way to split errors are compile time versus runtime errors. But if we go deeper, we can find out that runtime errors can happen, can happen either in the application initialization stage or at any moment during application runtime. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, there are some errors that can always happen and we can't do too much with it. Runtime environment can fail, physical machine can be powered off. Uh, we should design applications that are resilient to failures, uh, can be monitored using health checks, but it is also the point of this presentation. Uh, let's come back uh, to the error categories and consider example with application uh, configuration. Configuration, by nature, uh, can't be validated at compile time. By configuration, I mean everything that differs between uh, different deploys. And that configuration should be stored in environment variables according to 12-factor principles by Heroku. Uh, okay, so we have set of environment variables uh, independent from Scala and any other programming language. Uh, what we want to do is to read value from environment variable and put it into Scala code. Uh, the task seems to be obvious and trivial, however, there are some traps here. Uh, how uh, could we do this in Scala? Probably we would use uh, Hocon files. Hocon is well-known config format in Scala world. Files.conf uh, are written using this format. Uh, let's have a look at example file. Uh, what is nice here is that uh, there is possibility to read parameter value from a variable using this file but it is not limited to environment variables. You can provide the value just right, uh, just right away, as you can see in uh, other section uh, that B. Uh, moreover, moreover, you can overwrite parameters values, uh, uh, like here. Uh, other section does that B is uh, at the end. Uh, okay, uh, and this is the first place uh, that can complicate our lives. But what exactly is wrong here? Uh, let's have a look. Uh, when there is no such n variable oops, uh, here, Kafka URL, a Kafka URL parameter will gain default value. 
a similar situation uh, with other section that year. Uh, some will say that this is okay. Uh, it is desired behavior. But we don't exactly know what value the parameter have, has. Sorry. Uh, if we misspell a variable name, there is no error, no notification about that. We believe that the value is read from config and it's really a constant instead. Uh, this is why I'm not advocate for default parameters in config files. Rather, I prefer single assignment immutable parameter value. Uh, immutability is good even in configuration files. Uh, the same situation uh, happens when you move default, value from default values from .conf files to Scala code uh, itself. Uh, you can get the value uh, from config file and if it does not exist, you assign the default one. Uh, you don't know if the value from a variable or the default one was assigned. Moreover, if there, uh, already, if there is already default value in the .conf file, uh, you might have two layers of possible default values. It is, of course, yet more complicated than with a single one. Uh, this type of issues can uh, cause errors that are difficult to find. Uh, let's assume that you dockerize your application and then uh, you prepare docker compose.yaml uh, file and you have n variables uh, for your application. Uh, if you misspell one, how can you know, uh, how can you know that? Uh, you will probably leave thinking uh, that the application works on different set of parameters that it really is. Uh, of course, you can print the value at the program start. However, it still requires additional work uh, and you need to check the logs. Uh, believe me, uh, situations like this one, like the one I showed really happens. Uh, what's more, you can misspell a variable not only inside the docker compose.yaml file, but also in uh, application.com file uh, inside, uh, inside application code. Uh, just have a look at the example. Uh, people tend to make mistakes, uh, misspellings, and uh, uh, some part of those mis mistakes is not uh, catched by uh, reviews uh, done by other people. Uh, this is why we should be notified by machines, by computers, and our task is to enable them to notify us. Uh, by the way, did you notice misspellings uh, in the end of names? Yes, right. Okay, uh, let's stay for some more time with configuration issue. Uh, we have already seen default values which uh, can cause tricky errors, but it is not the only problem with configuration values which I've seen. Uh, I saw a lot of code when config values read from .conf file are all lazy values. It basically looks like that. Uh, lazy valves are, are a nice feature and may be helpful in various situations, but let's think how this code works and what it implies for us. Uh, each line will be evaluated on the first access. It means that uh, you will not know about configuration problem until the first access, uh, the first usage of variable. Uh, imagine uh, imagine application with HTTP server with several endpoints. When request comes to the specific endpoint, it then handles it. And, and uh, in order to handle the request, config value needs to be accessed. It is the first time the request comes. Uh, then appropriate lazy value from config is accessed also for the first time 
at and it may fail in that moment. Generally speaking, at any moment. Uh, for instance, imagine that there is HTTP endpoint, endpoint which needs to uh, access uh, some lazy val, and imagine that this endpoint is very rarely used. Uh, and the first time request arrives for this particular endpoint is two days after application start. Uh, then you will notice configuration problem. Uh, after two days, two days after you launch the application, or maybe after one year. Who knows? In my opinion, fail fast strategy is better option when it comes to configuration. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, runtime errors can happen either in the application initialization stage or at many, any moment during application runtime. Uh, in my opinion, it is much safer to move possible failures connected with configuration to initialization stage. Then, when initialization completes, we are sure that things are fine. Uh, you can achieve this by using regular vaults, or you can use some more sophisticated library than TypeSafe config, which was shown. You can use, for example, your config library where all you need uh, is to, to define these data types for your config and then load the config in a single line. Uh, what you will get is either config errors uh, and config type. Uh, in case of type safe config, uh, you get the value or there is exception thrown. Okay. Um, by the way, uh, taking the opportunity that we were talking about lazy valves a little bit, uh, I have some practical tip. Uh, don't use lazy valves in performance critical places of your application because of underlying implementation of lazy valves. Uh, I will not go into detail here, but lazy valves are generally not the most solid part of Scala. Hopefully, Scala free and dot implementation will be better. And one more notice. Uh, you have to keep in mind that objects are lazy in Scala. Uh, they are created lazily when they are referenced like a lazy val. Uh, if, the, if they are in local scope, then they behave exactly like uh, lazy val. Uh, it implies that when you have uh, settings inside Scala object, like here. Uh, then the valves inside the objects are initialized when object is accessed. Uh, in this example, accessing any of uh, the internal members of settings object will evaluate all of them. Uh, it is even enough to access settings object di di directly without touching an internal member, as you can see in the comment. Just settings. No, you don't have to write settings that something. If you write just settings, all internal members will be evaluated. When objects are in local scope, they are exactly uh, as lazy valves. So referencing Kafka URL will not evaluate other section uh, objects. So be careful uh, with that. OK. Uh, let's move to the next topic, serialization. Uh, if every application needs configuration, then almost every application needs serialization. Uh, the first case I will discuss is connected with uh, Google, uh, Google uh, protobuf, uh, Protocol Buffer Serialization. Uh, imagine application that uh, needs some model 
uh, classes to be serialized using protos. Let's assume that uh, there are some commands in the application which uh, looks like that. On, uh, you see, the, see them on the screen. And uh, all of these case classes needs to be serialized to binary form using protos. Uh, at the time the code was written, this code was written, a Java protos library was uh, chosen, and the Java library responsibility was uh, to map uh, uh, to map uh, protos specifications into Java classes. Uh, you may ask, uh, where is Scala then? So those Java classes, generated Java classes, were later mapped into Scala classes using uh, our custom mappers. Uh, you may ask yourself if mapping from Protoss specifications, from Protoss generated code into Scala uh, solves solve the problem. Uh, the answer is it may solve the problem, but it doesn't have to. There is Scala PB library, which does exactly that, uh, maps Protoss uh, directly to Scala classes. Uh, and you can use that Scala classes directly. Uh, the advantage of this approach is no need for additional mapper from generated code to our custom model and uh, vice versa. Uh, on the other side, there are some disadvantages. Uh, generated code is messy and uh, can't be su suited to your needs uh, as your own code. For example, you may not be able to use specific collection type like vector or list instead of, let's say, secu. Uh, in, order, in order to overcome uh, these issues, you would need mapper as well. Mappers from generated Scala code to pure case classes. Uh, and here you can see example of such mapper. Uh, as you can see, mapping uh, function is partial function and from any ref to, to any ref. Let's assume that uh, other piece of code requires partial function, any ref, any ref. This piece of code can be, for example, library code, and every mapping class translates generated Java class to corresponding Scala model. Uh, Java to Scala conversions have to be done when necessary, for example, in case of collections. Partial functions consist of two cases. First for mapping from generated uh, Java code to Scala, and the second from Scala to generated Java. Uh, it is then simply used uh, in other piece of code to serialize and deserialize model. What's wrong with this code? To be honest, it looks like JavaScript. Uh, you can uh, place one more case to the partial function and compiler will say that it's just fine, no problem. For example, like here. Uh, the problem may arise when uh, this will happen. Uh, incorrect type is returned because there is no type check. Uh, similar here. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, maybe I missed something. <laughs> oh, I see, I, I see now. So, uh, probably someone forgot to write or deleted that build uh, method at the end uh, here, and thus uh, <laughs> builder is, cr uh, is returned instead of uh, case class. So that's a very funny example. Okay. Uh, the problem is that type checks are not used properly. Of course, uh, tests could help us, but 
uh, they, do not, they do not cover that case. This presentation does not cover that case. You will, and as a solution, you may come up with code like this. Uh, what was improved? Uh, types were introduced. Instead of allowing almost everything by using any ref type, now two concrete type needs to be provided, one for Scala type and second for generated Java type with appropriate mapping functions. Scala to Proto and Proto to Scala. Uh, because partial function and ref, and ref is required by the external code, additional method uh, coupling them together is created and later used where needed. Uh, here you can see example implementation of the serializer. Uh, if we try to make similar mistakes as before, we get compile time error. Yes, we managed to move error from runtime to compile time. Uh, we can even say that not only we moved uh, possibility of error to compilation time, uh, but even to development time because uh, the incorrect, incorrect statements uh, should be marked uh, as incorrect by your IDE on the fly. Uh, the code is not uh, uh, only safer, but also looks more readable. Uh, it is impossible to make messy partial function cases as you saw on previous slides. Okay, uh, let's move to the next. Uh, there is very popular library in Scala which also uses partial function without safe types. It is a characters. Under receive alias, there is partial function and a unit. Uh, this is not something you would call type safe. You can add any case to the actor's receive method. You can return whatever you want. And when project uh, grows in size, you may find your actor's receive method rapidly growing in size. And, and when the graph of connections between the actors isn't simple enough, it is very difficult to refactor the code because all changes are taking effect in, at runtime. Compiler is not going to warn us here. Uh, imagine the actor with receive method that contains uh, two uh, cases, like here, sorry. And you suppose that uh, they are never used. Two, two final cases, add group and remove group. Uh, if you delete them, you may suffer from runtime failure. If you leave them, the code will remain messy because possible that code will still be present. You can also mark those cases with some warning lock uh, and investigate locks if the warning is present. Uh, there, however, you still can't be 100% sure if deleting the two cases is safe. Uh, some may say that if application is covered by tests enough, it's not a problem. Basically, this presentation doesn't cover test as a topic. However, you need to remember that testing ac actors isn't a trivial task. When expecting message, timeout needs to be provided, three seconds by default. Uh, when expecting no message, you also need timeout. Uh, timeout introduces non-determinism. Test uh, can pass on one device while failing uh, on the other where different amounts of CPU or RAM are available. Uh, it may sound uh, funny, but sometimes timeouts uh, needed to be increased in order to make tests uh, result uh, successful. Uh, I'm not complaining about ACCA. Some time ago I was, uh, I was fun, uh, and ACCA Actors is one of the very first libraries I was using in Scala. Uh, I just want, want to uh, encourage those of you who use it to investigate uh, other possible solutions also. Uh, in my team, we partially moved away from Akka to Monix. Uh, there is also Akka type project, which aims to provide a type safe actor model.
Okay. Uh, let's come back to, to our receive method and partial function in the unit. Uh, similar to Protos, more type safe code was extracted to external function. It looked like uh, that. Uh, in this particular case, uh, receive block is very small and it delegates its work to other particular, fun particular functions from command to list of events. And you can see it is now very clear what this method does. It takes command and results in events that should be returned when applied command in the current state. Uh, the next example I want to present is also connected with serialization, this time JSON serialization. There are plenty of JSON serialization libraries. One of them is JSON4S, where you need to provide abstraction cal called formats uh, to make your classes serializable. Uh, you can write your own custom serializers. However, you can use the default one called default formats. Uh, and those default formats uh, are, resolved, are not resolved at compile time. And they use uh, reflection at runtime to serialize object of any type. It can be dangerous. Uh, look at the example. It doesn't look suspicious. Probable is very widely used and compilation is successful. Uh, what actually happened when uh, serializing throwable was, um, does anyone know what, what can happen here? Here, the throwable is implicitly serialized to JSON. And in one, this will happen. Uh, serializing throwable, uh, infinity loop at runtime. It is very surprising uh, for me when my friend showed me this runtime error for the first time. To be honest, I couldn't believe. Uh, maybe next JSON for us releases fixed this. A uh, simple work workaround uh, works uh, as well because now the type to be serialized is string and hopefully it worked fine. You see, probable that get message is string type now. Uh, if something can be serialized because it lacks proper format, it might be better to know that fact and provide necessary implementation instead of using the default one for any type, which uh, we are unsure uh, how it is going to behave. Uh, as the next example, I consider two string methods uh, which came to Scala from Java world. Two string method is defined in any class, in Java object class. Every Scala and every Java class contains two string method, despite it is uh, sometimes useless and doesn't behave as most people would expect. Uh, consider two string method on list. Uh, uh, in contrast to array and some anonymous object. Uh, the first one is okay, however, second and third for me are useful, are useless. Uh, cat library provides similar functionality with show type class. Show allows us uh, to only have string conversion defined for the data types we actually want. Uh, if you try to call show on type without show instance defined for that concrete type, you will get compilation error. Uh, to be more precise, there is no implicit show instance for this concrete type, do not show me in scope. So it will not compile. And that's okay. Uh, also
also be careful with implicit. Uh, things you can create using implicit can be really powerful. However, uh, code can be hard to read, hard to reason about. Uh, there are places where implicit are practical or you even can't achieve the goal without them. The type class pattern, take, uh, take type class pattern as an example. Uh, sometimes I find that the usage of implicit devs can make your code more difficult to reason about and I prefer to use uh, the usage of implicit class instead because I have to explicitly call method from implicit class. Uh, it is illustrated on the slide. Uh, personally, I find the second case more readable. By the way, it is much easier to play with implicit with IDE. When IDE helps you, uh, uh, in IntelliJ, IntelliJ you can uh, use some combination, as I remember, Control Alt Shift Plus, and it will show you all usages of implicit uh, in the current file. Okay. Uh, let's move to the next part. Uh, for simplicity, let's assume that there are methods for getting users from database, as you can see on the slide. Uh, and all of them have a limit and offset parameters. The other parameters are different. Uh, for simplicity, let's assume that there are just two methods. And these methods call another method which also has limit and offset parameters. Uh, there may be more places in our code base where limit and offset are used. Uh, the goal of these parameters is to obtain some slice of data in this particular case, range of users, for instance, setting offset to zero and limit to seven gives us seven users standing from the beginning. Uh, by man manipulating offset, we can choose uh, the place uh, to start obtaining data from. For instance, setting offset to 100 and limit to three will result in users range from position 100, 101, and 102. Uh, of course, if there is not enough users in the database, you can get uh, incomplete range or even empty one. As you can see, both parameters have integer type. Both are ints. Because of that, it's very easy to make a mistake to swap the two parameters provided uh, to the function. And because both have exactly the same type, the failure, uh, because both have uh, the same time, the failure will arise at uh, runtime. Uh, meanwhile, compiling successful without even any warning. Uh, moreover, you can put any other int as limit or offset, as well uh, as uh, as well even if it doesn't make sense at all. Uh, for instance. Uh, if you would have person case class with age member of int type, that could be limit uh, or offset as well. And it still compiles. Now I'm going to talk a little about uh, Scala type aliases. Can they solve the issue? Unfortunately, making type aliases for limit and offset doesn't solve the problem. Uh, as you can see here. Why? Uh, because simple type aliases are not type safe, unfortunately. Limit and offset aren't newly created types. They are just new names for int and they can be used interchangeably. I mean, you can put limit in place or offset, where offset is required and vice versa. Whoops, sorry. 
this slide. <laughs> Uh, this is not something uh, we would expect. Not only this approach did not solve initial problem, but it complicated the situation even more. Why? Uh, because the code is still not, site, not type safe, and such mistakes are harder to catch. I think that they are harder to catch uh, because people tend to trust types by nature, and when seeing different types, which are just different names, uh, they suppose that the compiler will prevent such situations. Uh, I'm not saying that this syntax uh, is useless in Scala. The same syntax is used for abstracting, for example, path-dependent types. Okay. Simple type aliases didn't do the job. Uh, the next idea are value classes. Value class classes uh, are classes that wrap simple type and uh, extends an eval. They extend an eval. The goal of value classes is to provide type safety and avoid allocation, uh, runtime allocation. Uh, this means that Problem with limit and offset can be solved using, uh, using it, and what's more, there shouldn't be any extra runtime overhead. Uh, so we create appropriate value classes, one for limit and one for offset, as you can see. Uh, then we use newly created classes as types uh, in the method signatures, and it works. Now compiler will catch passing limit in place where offset is required and vice versa. Moreover, at runtime, these value classes should be uh, row int types. No extra uh, wrappers should be created. Fantastic, we gained type safety, cleaner code, easier to read and no runtime overhead. Unfortunately, runtime overhead sometimes happen uh, when using value classes. Uh, in most cases, there is zero overhead. However, when, for example, they are used as array elements, it is not so satisfactory. Uh, what happens then? Those classes limit and offset that wrapped integer type are being created also at runtime. Imagine creating value classes for different ID types. Uh, let's say user ID, group ID, etc. Uh, let's assume all of them wraps simple long value. It is likely that you will have collection of that type, and then at runtime, user ID, group ID, uh, maybe even more types are instantiated. They are not only they 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 are not simply ints, integers, but rather full wrapper classes. Uh, can we get rid of runtime overhead in all cases, meanwhile uh, preserving type safety? The answer is yes, thanks to tact types. Uh, tact types are simply types with tag. Uh, just have a look. Uh, there are several implementations of tact types in Scala, Shapeless, Scala, Scala Z uh, software mill. On the slide, uh, you can see the one from software mill. Uh, as you can guess, errors with uh, passing incorrect, incorrect type are catched by compiler. And there is no runtime overhead, overhead when tact types are used as sequence elements. Uh, similar to value classes, uh, they also uh, improve the readability of code. It's easier to reason about set of user ID instead of set of long, for example. Okay, it's time to sum up. In the, in the examples, uh, possible places when, where failures can happen, 
were moved from runtime to application initialization or even uh, to compilation time. And it is desired behavior. Uh, the examples uh, wasn't very sophisticated. Uh, you can do much more using advanced functional programming techniques. However, sometimes simple improvements can significantly make code safer and cleaner. Uh, remember that there is also always the opposite way which we should not choose. Uh, the way when compile time errors are moved to runtime. For instance, calling uh, that get directly on option, as you can see on the slide. Uh, there is possibility of null pointer exception here that could be easily avoided. Uh, generally, I think uh, it's better to know that something is wrong uh, than to believe that it's okay when it actually isn't. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Uh, as was mentioned at the beginning, uh, we have two uh, JetBrains licenses. Uh, does anyone have question? You may get one. Or if nobody, nobody has a question. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, those uh, new types. Uh, you mentioned value classes, and then you mentioned Scala tags. Have you uh, ex experimented with other libraries? Like, I think there are two uh, libraries. Uh, Fabulous Scala Z? So no, no. Uh, which are called something like new types. In Scala 3, I think there was the opaque type to, to solve the problem, but the new types, because this, uh, I, I experimented with this uh, uh, double add, but it, it, it adds a lot of boilerplate. It's not very nice to, to work with. It's my personal uh, taste. Uh, and I think there is, there is one or two libraries which are called like new type when you just annotate it. Uh, and the, and the add new there are in Scala 2 already, yes? On, or in yes, it's, they it's, will it's, it's, it supports Scala 2, but in Scala 3 I think it will be uh, uh, subsumed by, by opaque type. Okay, thanks. I, I will check that. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, if not, uh, I have one question for you. And if you answer, you will get JetBrains license. And uh, as we know, if there are many compiler warnings, uh, people tend to ignore them. If there are three, OK, we read it. It is number one, number two, number three. Something, something is strange. However, if we see 100 warnings, and I saw projects <laughs> with 100 warnings showing at compilation time, we just ignore all of them. And uh, can we make a Scala compiler uh, to turn all warnings into errors? If yes, how? Uh, oh, well, our friend was uh, first, sorry. <laughs> Yes, great. That's the right answer. OK, so we have all two licenses given. So thank you very much one more time.